All right. All right, good afternoon. We finished last time, completed completed chapter nine, and the topic is hot electron effects, all right? And a uh, brief review of what was discussed in the last, last hour. Uh, we derived a, uh, a, uh, a theoretical uh, base for plotting the accelerated lifetime data against substrate current in a log-log manner. And it, it, we predicted that such a plot should be a linear um, line. And indeed, uh, this has proven to be a very good way to extrapolate highly accelerated test data to predict lifetime at uh, the um, operating voltage of the circuit or the device, all right? And the equation would say the hot carrier lifetime is um, inversely proportional to the third power of the substrate current, and the three comes from the ratio of the critical energies for creating interface damage and uh, impact minimization, okay? We also talked about how to relate the lifetime obtained from DC measurement to the lifetime of failure of devices when it is used in a digital circuit. And the conclusion is that the ratio of the AC lifetime and DC lifetime is related to the duty factor, as you would uh, expect. The duty factor has to do with the period of the clock and the duration during which the input voltage, Vg, spans in the range where there is high density of hot carrier or large I sub. And turns out that range of voltage is only about a quarter of uh, Vdd. Therefore, this duration of stress is only about a quarter of the rise time of the input voltage. All right. So that then uh, leads to uh, a model that says uh, the ratio of lifetime has to do with four times over frequency times the rise time, okay? Any questions about uh, hot carrier effects? We also talk about P-channel hot effect, uh, P-channel transistor hot electron effects, and we also talked about some subtlety about the design of the LDD, which uh, uh, warns us that uh, we should not allow a lot of uh, very high electric field outside the portion of the device that is uh, under the control of the gate. Yeah? In other words, under the spacer, we should not allow very high electric field. Okay, questions? All right, if not, we're ready to um, move on to a new topic. And uh, if you had your reader Go to uh, the section 18, all right? And uh, those who uh, watch the tape later probably will find that this uh, notes will be arranged in the correct order. But for you guys, look under 18, okay? All right. Now the topic is SOI. SOI stands for silicon on insulator. This is not a this is a topic that's not found in the uh, textbook, so um, you probably will have um, um, no uh, uh, textbook uh, um, to help you with this subject, but there are a few journal articles in the uh, reader uh, book that uh, you all have, all right? And uh, it's also uh, arranged in, um, sort of a corresponding to the uh, uh, slide lecture number. So it's out of order. You have to go back a little bit from where you are in the, uh, in the assigned reading uh, reader to find the articles on SOI, silicon insulator. Okay? So we're going to be talking about SOI or silicon insulator. And, uh, well, what is silicon insulator? Let's just go directly to it, all right? Silicon insulator refers to a wafer. 
This wafer, if you just look at it, you know, does not necessarily look very different from uh, um, the regular wafer. Actually, color is a little different. But most of this wafer is still silicon. All right? What I drew here is not to scale. It's still silicon. It's only the top uh, half micron or so that's different. Now, what's on top of the silicon wafer? On the other hand, let me just point out, we use the silicon substrate um, uh, functionally only as a mechanical support. Nothing is going to happen in the silicon substrate. All right? It's only a mechanical support. On top of the silicon substrate, there is a insulator, SiO2, and it's amorphous silicon. Okay? Not, not epitaxial SiO2, just in, uh, this amorphous SiO2. On top, and this may be, uh, let's say, uh, between half a micron thick to um, less than 0.1 micron thick. Okay? So let's just call that 0.2 micron thick just for now. On top of that, is a, a thin layer of silicon, let's say about 0.1 micron thick. It may even be thinner, sometimes thicker. Uh, and this particular layer of silicon on top is a high quality single crystalline material. Now, how do we get to this uh, material, uh, putting a high quality single crystalline silicon film on top of amorphous SiO2? We'll get that to that in a moment, all right? But I want to point out. All the devices were made in this top 0.1 micron silicon film. Right? So SOI refers to this technology, refers to the substrate, sometimes even refers to this particular film, silicon on insulator. All right? So this, this term is used in, in all different ways. It's OK? That's called SOI. So, and uh, when we do use it, I said we make transistors in there. Well. After we finish making the transistor, what does the transistor look like? Looks like what's on the right hand side. Here is this uh, SiO2. This is SiO2 that we said insulated SiO2. Sometimes we'll give this a name, by the way. We call this buried oxide, all right? This might as well. Buried oxide. And uh, some, some people in the literature even call this box. It's probably not necessary to abbreviate so much. This is called buried oxide. All right? On top of this buried oxide, you have this very thin silicon film. And there, for example, you can uh, either use etching or simply use oxidation to create this SiO2. Okay? That's the field region, the isolation. This SiO2 isolates one transistor from its neighbors. Right? And, uh, Inside this island of silicon film, then you can put down, for example, a gate, grow the oxide, put down the gate, and implant the source and drain, right? And you end up with source and drain and channel. Is that right? It's okay? All right? And that's a transistor. So, in many ways, you can visualize perhaps in the future, SiO2 process may even be simpler. Okay, just because isolation may be easier, may be easier to make shallow junction. I'm also saying maybe because this is unproven yet. But the hope is that, or some people would argue, that eventually SiO2 may, uh, circuits may even be cheaper than bulk circuit because you can um, pay more for the substrate, but you save in processing. All right? That's perhaps wishful thinking. Today, the interest in, in SOI is that it does give us somewhat faster circuit speed, maybe 20%. It's debatable exactly what that number is. So much so that one company, S, uh, IBM, is in volume production of this material and is even willing to do foundry for others. And, uh, I, and AMD is committed to uh, make their uh, processor in SOI. Uh, Intel, on the other hand, uh, still says that they don't see the uh, um, enough benefit to, to move in that direction. But anyway, SOI is a, an important technology, OK? It's not just a research anymore. All right. OK. Now, how is this SOI substrate fabricated? There are several ways of fabricating it. Um, OK, more or less in chronological order. Turns out uh, a breakthrough came about um, oh, 
15, 12 years ago, when it was uh, realized that you could implant enough oxygen into a silicon wafer such that a layer of silicon can be converted into SiO2 just by implanting oxygen. All right? You're putting so much oxygen that you actually form a layer of SiO2. Right? But remember the, the property of implantation is that if you use high enough implantation energy, you can actually throw the oxygen at, to a position not at the surface. Let's say you can throw it at 0.2 or 0.3 micron below the surface. So SiO2 is formed subsurface. Now that's not surprising. Surprising things that is we can still keep the silicon near the surface, single crystalline, and high quality. All right. Now how does that happen? How does that uh, happen? Okay. Those of you that knows about implantation knows that if you uh, implant a dose of 10 to the 14, you already amorphize the silicon. All right. And here, in order to have a significant layer of silicon converting to oxide, we have to implant up to 10 to the 18th per centimeter square of oxygen. Now, that's a high end. Today, we can get away with a few times 10 to 17. I'll tell you some of the things that's, that's happening. But up to this. So with this much oxygen throw, throwing, thrown through this top layer of silicon at fairly high energy, how can you still maintain high quality of silicon? And not only it's not amorphous, but actually it's high quality. Well, let's just say why it's not amorphous as a result of so much damage by silicon. Normally, we know implanting only 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 of species through silicon it is going to amorphize the silicon, it becomes amorphous. What well, turns out the trick is that the implantation is done at an elevated temperature. What happens is that amorphous silicon can fairly easily be converted into crystalline again through epitaxy at low temperature. Right? So if you do implantation at this temperature, the damage produced by implantation is repaired fast enough so that you never damage the silicon. Do you see what I'm saying? All right? So if you have any damage, anneal, we'll anneal that out. All right? It's OK? All right. So that was a breakthrough. And uh, through that technology, um, the industry can now just implanting oxygen in there and then end up with, um, with uh, SOI. Now, another very important part is the next part, annealing at larger than 1,300 degrees C. Before this annealing, what you're going to get is probably going to get SiOx, and particularly the boundary is really very fussy, right? You don't know what silicon or silicon dioxide. That's what you're going to have. But the interesting thing is that when you anneal this wafer at high temperature, actually, thermodynamics takes over. First of all, ox oxygen can diffuse easily back and forth. And where would oxygen like to go? It likes to bond with silicon to form SiO2. It doesn't like to stay you know, with SiOx or just the dissolved into silicon. You actually go into where you have silicon SiO2 and just continue to increase the thickness of this layer until all the oxygen is consumed by this layer with n no oxygen or very little oxygen left elsewhere. So much so that this interface is really of a quality not very different from the thermal oxide we grow on top of our transistor channel. We can actually operate a transistor using this interface as the uh, conduction channel and the measure its mobility, and measure interface trap density, and you're going to find actually it's pretty good interface. All right. Having said that, let me still point out: still we're using the top surface, of course, to operate. But I just use that to to uh, to, illustrate, to to highlight the point that actually this surface don't think is some kind of unknown SiOx. It's a very high quality silicon SiO2 interface. Question. All right, I will, I will say that again. Uh, but the next time to re uh, sit at a spot 
where the microphone is working. All right, all right. I need your questions. The uh, uh, the question is, uh, all right. He can understand that uh, silicon remains single crystalline, but why would this interface be sharp? If it's not sharp, what would it be? Let me draw a cross section of the oxygen concentration, if I may. All right. Now, right after implantation, the oxygen concentration probably will look something like that. All right. It does have a uh, you know peak somewhere below the surface, right? right? But it's by no means sharp. This is oxygen concentration that I'm talking about. Is that right? OK. Well, it turns out there's a pretty, fairly critical concentration of oxygen. It's a, a few times 10 to the 17s in the concentration. If it go beyond that, then, then um, uh, small um, uh, islands of SiO2 will uh, form. And material scientists will know, actually, if these uh, sites get large enough, they'll grow. You know, um, it's uh, called offspring awesome ripening and process like that. Oxygen just want to get close to that and enlarge the SiO2 island. Because uh, uh, energetically, that's, that's, uh, that's lower energy states than having the uh, oxygen uh, thrown around in, in, in everywhere. Right? So that after the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the high temperature anneal, you end up with this is the concentration profile. Okay? The concentration here is what's required to give you this st stoichiometric SiO2. Right? The thickness is then determined by the dose that you put in there. If you had put in more dose of, silica of oxygen per centimeter square, you simply get a thicker film. Is that right? You see that? OK. Still, however, to set up some limit on the kind of uh, uh, minimum amount of dose you have to throw into there. Otherwise, you won't form those islands to begin with. And then you still will not get the very high quality material afterwards. So there's a limit of how low you can go this dose. Right? But today, people can use as low as close to 10 to the 17. Now, that number is important because it turns out this dose translates to the time that you have to put a wafer in the implanter. And that turns into costs. As you know, a lot of the cost of semiconductor manufacturing is just equipment depreciation. So if you need to tie up an equipment for a long time, then you're going to pay more for it. All right? Okay, so that's in some way a downfall of this technology, not downfall, disadvantage of technology is expensive. All right? And uh, the hope, of course, is that implanter technology is in going to be improved, because why can't we design an implanter that has a you know, very high beam current, because we're not, you know, we don't require the same kind of control may, as a say, source string implant. So there are, there are things you can hope that will happen. But today's cost is still high. Yes. This technology, how about the mechanical stress inside of this? Again, high temperature and NEO takes care of that. All right. okay. At this temperature, everything is flowing. In fact, the coarse tube would even sag. So this, is, this SiO2 actually flows very easily. So you can, should think of this as it may be a uh, liquidy uh, material at that temperature. And uh, so things just just, just re flow and stress is relieved. Okay, good questions. All right, another technique, as I said, is chronologically, is um, um, uh, done is that partly motivated by the suspicion that the quality of that silicon film made by this technique, this is called a cymox. This stands for separation by implantation of oxygen, but most people probably don't care what it stands for, just like probably most of you don't know what SPICE stands for, right? How many of you know what SPICE stands for? OK. <laughs> I'm not even sure I can reproduce that. I think a simulation program with IC emphasis, all right? Simulation program with IC emphasis, okay? that's SPICE, So which is called the CIMOX, all right? So you say Cymox, people know what you're talking about. Now, we for bonding and, uh, and etch back. Now, what this does is that there's always suspicion that the Cymox uh, SI, um, uh, SOI wafer, the quality it is, it cannot be too good, just too good to be true. And it turns out the quality is very good, all right? So as time goes on, now we believe it's good enough to, high, good enough to make uh, high-performance processors and the DRAMs. That's not a concern. But 
but it took a long time for people to gain that confidence. You know, this is what uh, manufacturing requires. There's a lot of detail before, before uh, uh, you know, we can really decide this is good enough. So during that period where there's concern, there was a technology that um, uh, um, received a lot of attention it's called wafer bonding and etch back. What you do is you take two silicon substrate, okay? These are two silicon substrate. You grow a little oxide on, on, on the surface. You put the silicon wafer, just put it mechanically uh, face to face, silicon oxide touching oxide, all right? Okay? And maybe you apply a little pressure or even a vendor vol vol force pressures enough. You put this into a furnace, anneal this, perhaps at, um, uh, uh, say, say uh, 900 degree. It could even be lower temperature for a short while. This oxide just fuse together, OK? So become one piece of material. Next, what you do is you lap or polish away the silicon from the top wafer until you get to the dotted line. When you get the dotted line, you have a thin film of uh, single crystalline as a silicon on top of buried oxide. You see that? All right. Now, this actually for a while was a very strong competitor with, uh, with Cymox, but uh, uh, gradually, you know, cost the, is, is the issue, and um, it's difficult to get the silicon to very thin film that we want and uh, Cymox is getting more uh, accepted. So this kind of fought by the wayside. However, another s technique comes on, uh, in some sense, is similar to that. What, they, what, what happens is this. You take a, um, um, a uh, uh, silicon substrate. You implant hydrogen, all right? into the silicon, and the dose does not have to be as high. Perhaps uh, 10 to the um, uh, 15th uh, is enough. Uh, it's known that if you pl implant uh, uh, inert gases um, into, uh, or gases, uh, into a silicon such as argon implant, bubbles are formed in the, uh, in, in the silicon. That's often a problem. In this case, we'll take advantage of that. So if you implant hydrogen, and, okay, let me do step, step by step. Next, you wafer bound this to another silicon. All right, so uh, how do I do this? Um, okay, here, let's look at this way, okay? This is the next slide. So you bound this uh, silicon wafer with the um, hydrogen implanted together with another wafer, all right? Okay? After this is done, you heat this to a certain temperature. Oc hydrogen now... Uh, now, um, uh, um, uh, um, gather together and form bubbles. And that causes this wafer to crack. And you end up with this situation. Can you see that? All right, it's hard to believe, maybe, but that it really just happened just like that. However, the surface is not very smooth. So after this, you have to do a little light polishing. Right? Unlike after you cut the wafer from an uh, ingot into a slide, into, into wafer, you have to polish this. So you polish it, and that becomes high-quality silicon material. And this is a uh, technique, uh, uh, well, uh, commercialized um, uh, by a company, French company called Soitec, and uh, invented in a, in a uh, French institution, LATI. And, uh, it's um, their trademark for this uh, technique, technology called smart cut. So it's a smart cut wafer or soy type wafer, SOI wafer, then people know what this is, this is about. And this is looking very good, OK? Yes? Uh, the silicon dioxide uh, in the second and third case is still amorphous material? Second and third, yes, 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 yes. Uh, there has been no success in uh, growing uh, or even depositing uh, uh, crystalline SiO2 on, uh, on uh, silicon. Okay, there's some success in growing other type of dielectric silicon, such as calcium oxide, but none of them had been uh, very uh, uh, successful. And uh, so, so basically, we don't have single crystalline insulator on silicon anywhere today. Okay, SiO2 specifically is always amorphous when you see this in the silicon technology. 
question, Garth? I think you just answered it. The question was the gate oxide. Mm -hmm. It's always high quality and mm -hmm. everything, but that's not single crystal. Definitely that's not. not. Crystalline it's always either. amorphous. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering why. So it, so it seems sort of out of the blue. Now we're talking about crystalline silicon dioxide. Um, just crystalline silicon dioxide is quartz, isn't it? That's correct. Okay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I think the reason this question was raised probably is that somehow if you have a crystalline SiO2, perhaps it's more uh, thinkable to have crystalline uh, silicon on top of that. But the fact is that SOI wafer today has single crystalline silicon thin film on top of amorphous SiO2. No, no ifs and buts about it. Yes? When you said amorphous, you mean polycrystal or mm -mm, the amorphous SiO2? Amorphous, just like, just like glass. Just like, it is glass. Okay. Uh-huh or uh, fuse the quartz rather than uh, quartz uh, crystal. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, a few other things. Uh, I'll just mention, maybe I won't mention this. And, uh, let me mention another one in the next slide that's a, a more interesting. It's called internal oxidation. NTT uh, invented this process. Canon company sells SIOI wafers using this process. So in this case, what's done is you implant a much lower dose of uh, oxygen, just enough so that you form s some SiO, SiO2 uh, layer. Now maybe it's too thin, maybe the quality is not so good, maybe there's some pinholes. But then what you do, this is a really surprising thing, all right? So if you um, uh, see this, you will have no problem seeing that we could get uh, uh, um, uh, clean uh, SiO2 SiO2 and silicon interface at in the uh, in the Cymox process. So after you have done this, so far it's like Cymox, except you're not implanting as much oxygen, therefore the cost a lot lower, right? Ten times lower dose, right? After that, you know, they will put this into an oxidation furnace. Oxidation furnace, right? Normally you would expect sec, expect oxide to grow on the surface. But just because there's an existing SiO2 layer close to the surface, oxygen would actually like to diffuse through this and enhance or enlarge or thicken this existing SiO2 layer rather than growing new as oxide on the surface. OK? So that just shows you oxygen really like to go to where the SiO2 is, all right? And as a result, after that, they get a higher quality, thicker SiO2, and that becomes SiO SOI wafer that's ready for sales. Question? Yes. Okay. Really it's surprising, kind of, huh? Yeah, it's kind of silly, but it, it's obviously some sort of lowest energy state thing, but why does the oxygen know that there's oxygen farther away? You know, it's a uh, stochastic process. Oxygen obviously just diffuses all over, wherever it finds a bound, and it's happy it will stay there. Even if there's a bond, you should over, always visualize that bond is dynamically always broken and then reform, broken, reform. Right. So. Okay. All right. So um, that's how uh, SO, uh, SOI wafers are uh, manufactured today. Any questions? Okay. So now, when the uh, company like IBM gets that wafer, what do they do with it? All right. They're going to make uh, transistors. You know, just emphasizing the, um, the transistors. Each transistor basically is in, a, in an island. I don't mean to say there's no oxide here, but just simplify the picture. You would have uh, one island one island for each transistor. In, in this case, I showed one transistor that's N-channel transistor. Next to it, there's a P-channel transistor, right? You can visualize how you can make this like that, right? It's not difficult. You don't need a well anymore, right? You don't need to use a P well and well, like in the bulk transit CMOS technology, all right? OK. And you can even make BJT like that, right? Just uh, use multiple diffusion. For example, you might uh, first diffuse a P here for the base, and then do another P diffusion for the emitter, and, and plus diffusion for the emitter. And then you would have an emitter, base, um, collector, and the heavily doped the collector, that would be equivalent of barrier layer of the collector. Is that right? Yes. So this would, this would just be f to have a lateral device. This is not considered a high performance BJT because 
It's well, not a vertical divide. You know, it depends. Suppose you can make the uh, this uh, this uh, 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 um, base width uh, as thin as uh, let's say 200 angstrom. You can even argue use this process. You have better control of the base width than the vertical process. It's possible, right? So it's hard to say. But the fact is that today uh, um, this kind of um, BJT in SOI is not high high performance, and no one is uh, seriously looking at uh, uh, SOI for, uh, at least not for lateral BJT applications. Uh, the serious work is on a CMOS right now, okay? But if you ask, can there be by CMOS? I would say yes, it's certainly possible. Okay. All right. Uh, and since we're on this, let me point out one interesting um, ap um, uh, advantage of SOI is actually because it's the presence of SiO2, you just have more more options. For example, you can make even PMPN structures. It will be very difficult to do that kind of isolation in the bulk. So you, all you're studying for something like thyristor, you have negative resistance. A company called a TRAM is trying to commercialize a new DRAM uh, device based on PMPN structures, for example. And maybe some type of MEM structure can be fabricated more easily by making use of this uh, oxide barrier layer. So SIO2, I mean, SOI certainly has that potential. Um, but right now, I guess its challenge is to find an entry point to uh, make it accepted in the, in the mainstream IC of fab. And then you know, all these other things can happen, right? All right. So today, the attraction is higher performance, OK? And why is performance higher? The obvious thing to say is that you know, we have uh, eliminated junction capacitance, right? We don't have the, uh, the uh, source string junctions anymore. Right? And like here, in this bulk transistor, we have all this capacitance, all right? right? Here is right on oxide. So you don't have the capacitance, is that correct? So that's one advantage, and certainly it's an advantage. But it's also true that uh, there are many other ca capacitances in, the, um, in a circuit, not just the junction. There's the gate oxide capacitance. This is not helping. There's the interconnect capacitance. This is not helping very much. Maybe it helps somewhat the metal one to ground the, to substrate capacitance, but may not be helping the uh, you know, metal one to metal two, and so on and so forth. So there has been quite a bit of uh, uh, questioning how important that is. But, but it is uh, significant. It's very difficult to uh, figure out how much advantage the reduction of capacitance uh, really is. Um, because you know a complex circuit, as I said, there's so many capacitances. What do you do? Uh, one interesting way, actually, is this. I've only seen one, comp uh, one, one paper that uh, did this, and certainly clever thing to do. And uh, Matsushita did this. He said, all right, let's not argue, right? Let's just uh, fabricate a uh, multiplier in the bulk um, substrate and in the SOI. Is that right? After we, 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 uh, we, 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 uh, we uh, uh, have these two circuits running, let's make a plot of power versus VDD squared. In fact, you can plot it in other ways. Why do we do that? Because the power is equal to the switching frequency or the operating frequency, let's say we operate a two, two, two circuit in the same frequency, times VDD squared times C. Is that right? Yes? And this, of course, we kind of introduced this as just one gate. But you can generalize this concept, right? Just see just the, the, the effect of overall chip uh, uh, capacitance of the chip. Is that right? Right? And here we're not saying it's the oxide or it's interconnect or the junction. We don't care. We just see whatever is the total power the consu the, uh, consumption of this chip. All right? And actually, when they did this, they did this in 0.6 micron, they see a 30% improvement of a power right? at the same VDD. That's the point thing. Okay? Not at the same speed, the same VDD. And uh, so you would uh, have to conclude that there, there, at least there was significant uh, uh, capacitance reduction. And uh, I think this is an uh, interesting way of using these uh, type of concepts that um, you know, we have looked at before so to answer a very complicated question, right? Now, so maybe, maybe uh, uh, for some critical um, path and for, for certain really uh, uh, long uh, lines, the, uh, the impact on the speed is not really that. 
suppose uh, the overall um, improvement in the um, in the uh, um, power can be ten percent. Now that's not something to to um, to uh, ignore either. Okay, let's continue about why it's faster. So maybe capacitance help. Maybe capacitance does not help very much when it comes to critical paths. We don't know for sure. SOM MOSFET does not have body bias effect, okay, or the body effect. Let's look at this example. This is an end gate, all right? Look at this uh, pull down end channel transistor. You have three in series, is that right? Because you have the three in series, and if this was bulk technology, right, all the three transistors will have the same body potential, is that right? Yes, because they are all grounded, and yet, they potentially can have three different source voltages. Therefore, some of these transistors will not have zero body bias. VBS is not zero. And when VBS is not zero, what happens to VT? VT becomes higher. And what does that do to the performance of that transistor? Slower, right? ID set is smaller, so the circuit is smaller. Is that right? SOI does not have that, that situation because if you look at SOI transistor, what is the potential of this body? Remember I said each transistor is made in an in in isolated uh, island, and the part of the island is converted into M plus source, part of the island is converted into M plus drain, and what's left in the middle is the, uh, is the uh, body. So is the body connected to ground? No, it's not. It's floating. So it's very important word is floating body. Floating body, all right? Okay? Floating body. Because the body is floating, we don't have this body bias effect. Each of these three transistors, can, the body can float to some, some voltage independent of the others. Right? So you, you limit this body effect. And that probably is the major contribution to the uh, uh, improvement in speed, probably, all right? Okay. And uh, bod uh, elimination body effect is particularly important for a passcade transistor, actually. Not there, you can have a, a large uh, body uh, bias as large as VCC, as you know. The next point, ID set may even be raised by, raised by the floating body effect. Okay, let's see what this means. The first bullet says, the body will not be reverse biased, unlike in the, uh, in, unlike in the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, bulk devices, bulk circuits, the body and source may be reverse biased, right? That's body and source is reverse, may be reverse biased. That's what we mean by body effect, body bias, right? Typically, it's reverse bias. It's that reverse bias that will raise the VT and reduce the performance. In SOI, not only you don't have that, in fact, you may even have a positive or forward bias between the floating body and the source. And I, we can see later why, all right, in a minute. But if indeed you can have that, let's say 0.3 volt forward bias, 0.4 bias, uh, bias, what does that do to the VT? It lowers it, right? So that will actually will enhance ID set. Isn't that right? That's great. Of course, there are also problems, but we'll, we'll get to that later. But before then, let me just quickly tell you what raises the uh, floating body potential. Now, suppose you have a source as ground, right? You have a uh, drain as a uh, as a at VDD. What would be the potential in the in the body? Is it going to be ground? Not necessarily. It will be somewhere in between. Is that right? Okay, so that just shows that it's possible. Now that's actually not exactly where what SOI designers would like to see. What they would like to see is this one. All right, suppose we have a case where this transistor is in the off state, VG is zero. Is that right? It's okay. Now I'm trying to turn the transistor on. Okay, so what I do, I suddenly apply a pulse to the gate raised from zero to VDD. Yes. Now the gate has a strong capacitance coupling to the body, right? So when the gate voltage rises from zero to VDD, what will that do to the floating body potential? Remember, body is floating, right? So it can be anywhere. So what will that rising voltage on VG do to 
to the potential of the floating body? Put it up, right. And when this body is put up, what does that do to VT? VT drops. Wow, isn't that great? You know, when you want to turn the transistor down, VT drops. <laughs> isn't that wonderful, right? So that is uh, one advantage of uh, the SOI, OK? You may, if you really, um, uh, later this also is a problem, I'll, 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 but I'll wait uh, to before telling you the, the downside of it. So certainly, potentially, you can get even better speed by taking advantage of that, all right? OK. Finally, another thing that makes the uh, performance better is that substrate swing can be better. This depends on the design of the, uh, trans of the SOI. Now, there are two kinds of uh, transistor uh, SOI uh, technology. One is called partial depletion or partially depleted SOI. One is called a full depletion or fully depleted SOI. So partially depleted SOI or fully depleted SOI. OK? All right. Now, what does that mean? Partially depleted SOI means if the SOI film is thin enough, actually, this entire film is depleted. That's possible, right? If the entire film is depleted, let's think what happens to the swing. Remember what swing is? Well, maybe I should start with, stay with partially depleted. That, that, that will give you a chance to refresh your memory. Partially depleted SOI means the silicon SOI film is thick enough so that only a portion of the SOI film is occupied by the depletion layer, and the rest is the uh, neutral, right? In other words, silicon film thickness is larger than XD max, all right? In that case, in that case, the swing is the same as the swing of a bulk transistor. It's equal to 60 millivolt, 1 plus C depletion over C aux. This is C aux, this is C depletion. And remember where that came from? It's the coupling of the it's a capacitance divider, right? We put VG here. It's divided by this two capacitor to give us the potential on the, on, at the surface. Is that right? OK, now let me show you what happens in the uh, fully depleted SOI, then I'll answer questions. In a fully depleted SOI, as you can see, if the film is thin enough, how would you model a swing? How would you model a swing? What determines the potential at the surface, at the interface of uh, SiO2 and silicon? Which two capacitor determines that, uh, that voltage division? Doesn't make sense. It's this oxide capacitance again. But the, the coupling between the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the ground plate for the other capacitance, the other capacitor is now moved from this XD max, in fact, go beyond SiO2 up to the other side of the buried oxide, because that's where you have a solid ground. Is that right? Yeah? So all in a sudden, you improve the swing very close to the ideal swing. You see what I'm talking about? Yes? Say it again. Swing is equal to 1 plus C depletion over C aux. C depletion meaning the bottom capacitance. C aux is the top capacitance. In other words, it's the two capacitance, one couples to VG, one couples the interface to the ground. In the fully depleted SOI, the capacitance that couples the interface to the ground is a very small capacitance, a very thick insulator. Not only is the fully depleted SOI film thickness, but also the fairly thick buried oxide thickness. In other words, this interface has very little coupling to ground. Therefore, it can move up and down totally in step with VG. That's another way of thinking about it. Nothing is pulling this down away from VG, right? OK, question. I'm, I'm missing even in the top part. I mean, the, the bottom shaded region is? It's a neutral silicon. It's just like a bulk transistor. You have neutral silicon. So here's Oh, I'm sorry. I'm missing silicon. the whole drawing. I, uh, top portion is depletion region. This portion is neutral silicon. But underneath that, though, this is not exactly the same. Underneath I thought that, it will be SiO2, the buried right, so oxide. So if there's SiO2, the bottom plate still is not terminated. I mean, there's nothing that's determining the bottom plate potential in either case. Uh huh. So why, when you, when you say we have a capacitive divider, the bottom plate of that capacitive divider has to be terminated to a solid potential. What, what's determining Extremely that Extremely good uh, question. Thank you very much for clarifying that. So what we're saying is that in the swing, we usually think about as a DC characteristics. Let's suppose we consider swing under DC condition, right? 
meaning uh, you know, we're not changing this VG very rapidly. If we change VG rapidly, indeed, this potential can move up, up and down very easily. But if we do these things in a very slow manner, what's going to come to determine this potential, all right? Is what? Think about it. It's independent of VG to the first order, but maybe dependent on VD, you know, somewhere between VD and, uh, and the ground. So as far as the, the re relation to the swing, it will be considered as a fixed voltage. As long as it's not independent, dependent on VG, this will be the swing. Okay? All right. Okay. So, Therefore, suppressed swing can be better if you chose this uh, fully depleted technology. And this last bullet, of course, is taken seriously by people who are trying to do, uh, uh, could we, OK, um, could we, yeah, show more of the slide. Ah, very good. Thank you very much. OK, good. The, uh, so uh, so uh, if you are particularly interested in a low power application, low VDD, a portable uh, application, then perhaps by using better swing, you can design the VT lower, and therefore you can use the lower VDD to get a performance, and then your battery will last longer. So this is one thing that potentially could be, could be beneficial, all right? All right, so uh, I have uh, told you um, uh, some good things about SOI. Now I'm going to tell you some of the difficulty with, uh, with SOI, all right? First, this floating body effect in partially depleted SOI MOSFET. In the previous slide, I mentioned them as being good. Now, let me say there's some difficulties. One is that if you just look at the IV curve, okay, often they, they look funny. You know, this is hand drawing and someone else traced my hand drawing, so it looks a little funnier than I intended to be. But the fact is that, you know, it's not very nice output conductance. Often there's even a little kink, okay? Sometimes called a kink in the DC IV. And this makes analog design difficult, all right? So this is something difficult. For digital, maybe we don't care. Uh, Okay, uh, but we already said this could, could provide larger ID, right? This floating body effect. Another difficult thing is that the VT now become history dependent, and that complicates circuit design. Now, what do we mean by that? Because the body does not have a fixed potential, right? Yeah? Its potential is difficult to predict. You know, I only gave you one example. When the, uh, the uh, VG first go up, it's uh, going to come up with it. If that's the only thing that ever happens, maybe you can predict that VT. But who knows what VT is at the beginning of this ramp up pulse, for example. It depends on, you know, when was the last pulse ended? How was it ended? You know, how much DC leakage current there is between the drain and the body. And that will determine how close the body potential is, is to the VDD, for example. Right? Or how leaky is the body and the source junction. That will determine how close it is to ground. You see what I'm talking about? Okay, that's technology dependent. That's not what, not what I meant by history dependent. History dependent would mean things like, you know, if you are talking about a um, a um, a, um, a uh, just a uh, an inverter, it depends on how frequently you switch it. Okay, depends on how long was the uh, the, the delay from the last uh, uh, switching event. Okay, now that makes the the the, the, the circuit design more, much more complicated. You see what I'm saying? And IBM also uh, said so in their publication, but um, uh, their experience is that you know if you do the investment, you know putting good models and do this careful design, you end up with a net gain. In other words, you you fix where this could be a problem, and uh, you guard band where you need to guard band, and uh, you take advantage where there is good thing, and you still end up with with better performance. It's okay. But this does make this more complicated. So for many ASIC companies, um, um, you know, or foundries that want to provide ASIC uh, technology, mostly in in um, in, um, in Japan, to be specific, companies actually are still uh, looking for ways to uh, minimize this uh, floating body effect. And I'll show you what in the next slide. All right. So floating body effect is not always a good thing. All right. So a double-edged sword there, okay? All right, all right, let's see. Okay, so 
So uh, let's just talk a little bit more what determines the floating body potential, right? So, uh, uh, you know, depending on what you do, for example, because the drink body has a leakage, then the potential may be close to the body, right? But then uh, there's this, this current also leaks into the source. But even though this junction is forward bias junction, you see P and N is forward bias junction, turns out you still need a little voltage for, for forward bias diodes to remove that pickle end that comes from the drain, for example. All right? So you can always have a little bit forward bias. Okay? All right. So forward bias between the body and source slightly. So under DC condition, I'll give you an example where you can get the forward bias is VDS is up then the body can be higher, right? Just because, you know, it's always somewhere between the, the drain and the source, that potential. All right? Okay? And if the body is high, VT will drop, ID will go up. Okay? Of course, you can immediately say, gee, I can see this is a bad thing. Why? This means VT is sensitive to VD. And it's true. Okay? VT is sensitive to VD, even for long channel transistors now even for long channel transistors. Because this behavior just comes from when you apply a large voltage on VD, there may be junction leakage, right? That will cause the floating body potential to go up. Doesn't matter whether it's 0.1 micron or 0.5 micron. So this is not the, the VT roll off that we talked about before or the dimple. This is a different kind of uh, VT sensitive to VD, okay? So again, it's kind of a design and modeling issue, but um, if you, um, you know, have good model and designed well, apparently this can be dealt with. Now under transient condition, I already gave the example, VG ramps up, then body potential goes up, VT drops, ID goes up, and you can get better speed, all right? Okay. All right, next, uh, um, all right, suppose you don't like that kinky effect. You don't like that uh, floating body effect, suppose, right? Is there something you can do to minimize that? Turns out there's something you could do. It's known that fully depleted SOI MOSFET exhibits no is acceleration. Maybe some people thought no, that I really want to e emphasize little, all right? Less, well, little, okay? Uh, maybe I'll draw, just cross that out. That's what I'll do. Uh, exhibits little floating body effect. Okay, and for example, the uh, the uh, kinky fat is not usually not uh, visible. Although if you look at its uh, its uh, output conductance, still significantly larger than the bulk. And when you look into this, we believe it should still be explained by quote unquote uh, 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 floating body effect. But it's much less. So why isn't that less? And therefore, dependence on history and everything is also less. And this makes circuit design easy, easier. Why is less? What well, turns out, what it is is that, you know, if you understand the floating body effect the way I introduced to you, you really need to have this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, neutral region there to apply the concept of a body bias that we have had so far in this course. Because we only, always had a neutral body and then neutral not just, uh, yeah, it's a body, undepleted body. That body has a bias with uh, 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 respect to silicon, and that will change the depletion charge, change the depletion region thickness, right? Yeah? Change the, uh, the, the charge in the substrate, change the band bending, and therefore change VT. Yeah? So suppose the film is totally depleted, right? Then the depletion charge will never change. No matter what your floating body potential is, in fact, it becomes very difficult to define the floating body potential. Right? That's why I say, you know, I believe the interpretation of these output conductance is still floating body, but you actually have to generalize that concept. What is the floating body? What really is, is just generalized to that it has to do with the band bending here. You know? Is it possible that band bending is different as a result of a stored host near the back side of the surface? It is. Turns out if you look into, if you draw the energy band diagram, you're going to find there's a potential well somewhere in the, in, the, in the back side of the surface. That's where holes can accumulate, all right? And the holes cannot even flow into the source easily because there's a potential barrier even between this well and the source, certainly between barrier and the drain. So holes get stored here. If holes get stored here, it's going to change the, the energy band diagram in such a way, actually VT is still changing. 
but the, the change is much less, and therefore you, you don't have as much floating body effect. Okay, so to the first order, if you want to say, um, you know, few, uh, uh, full dependent SOI transistors do not have floating body effect, you know, I probably won't argue with you, but um, if you from there then uh, in, infer that uh, a fully depleted SOI transistor has uh, you know, similar analog behavior or, or identical analog behavior with bulk transistors, you'll be disappointed. All right? And even for digital circuit, it will be still a little bit history dependent, just much less. OK? All right. All right. So uh, to summarize, the comparison between fully depleted and uh, partially depleted SOI, both are in use today. Different companies are pursuing, pursuing different technologies. Fully depleted SOI has little floating body effect. Circuit design is simple. Small threshold swing is good for low VDD application. Right? There are several good things going for it. However, it tends to have a larger series resistance. Just because this film is thinner, just because the film is thinner, right, your series resistance is larger. It has a worse short channel effect. Now, this surprised people um, uh, because uh, some people would think, you know, if this film is thin, fully depleted, right, then you get a, almost automatically get a shallower junction, right? Then short channel effect should be better. The fact it's not better is because now. Here's the M plus, here's the M plus. Now you have this additional coupling. Okay. All right. This coupling here. Okay. Such that, uh, uh, put another way, maybe this is not a good way of answer. I ought to give you a better answer. Sorry, I'll take this away. This is not a good explanation. Right. Some people explain this this way, but I think there's a better way of explaining it, actually. Uh, all right. Okay. I want to see if some of you uh, already have explanation for this, all right? So, so compare two cases. In fact, I'll let you compare this against the bulk. And uh, I'll give you a hint. The bulk has behaved very similar to fully depleted uh, SOI in terms of short channel behavior, or maybe I should say vice versa. Bulk, uh, uh, bulk SOI has a uh, fully partially depleted SOI device, has almost identical short channel effect as bulk transistor. But a fully depleted SOI transistor has worse short channel effect. Now, can you see why a fully depleted <coughs> transistor should have worse <coughs> short channel effect, let's say VD <coughs> roll off, than bulk transistor? Other things are, 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 are identical or as identical as possible. Same oxide thickness, same you know, uh, whatever. I can even say the same junction depths, all right? Do you see any reason why fully depleted, not partially depleted SOI, so forget about partially depleted, just concentrate on fully depleted SOI, has a worse depot? Can you see why? Hmm? That's very good. Um, uh, um, I would word it this way. Do you remember there are two things we can do to control Dibble? Basically two things. Which are those two things? There are not that many things. I expect you remember that. Smaller TOX. Good. You got uh, um, 80 points out of 100 because that is indeed the first thing you want to do. Now there is a second thing we can do. What's that? XD Max. Do you remember XD Max? XD Max. XD Max performs the role very similar to TOX. That's why this this concept backgate is a very good one in, in this context, more better than maybe originally uh, we realized. So in this case, where's the backgate to this transistor? Where is it? Where is it? If you want to find one, you have to go to the bottom of the buried oxide, won't you? That certainly is not a happy situation for the uh, Dibble, right? OK? All right. So, uh, so that's one way to, uh, to understand why that's the case. That usually comes as a shocking news to, uh, 
to people who will casually think about the um, SOI demise. But it's experimentally proven as a fact. And needs more modification about this device design, like threshold voltage, right? like contact process, silicide process. If uh, the silicon film is very thin, and uh, you just have to uh, modify things more. right? Now, result is that we end up, typically so far, there's a um, uh, lower performance device than bulk device right now. Okay, certainly, and, and we just say that full partially depleted device is slightly higher performance than bulk. So we put the two together, um, ID set. When we say performance, let's say ID set. So ID set is better, uh, is, is, is poorer for this um, uh, fully depleted device compared to partially depleted. Okay? So put all this together. Finally, the conclusion is that fully depleted device seems to be favored by ASIC and memory companies. Where they, um, you know, um, well, I just leave it there. Don't I won't say say much. And uh, partial uh, depleted device favored by high-speed processor companies. That seems to be the case right now. Okay. So IBM, AMD are all using partially depleted SOI. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's see. Um, okay. So uh, here I'm just illustrating that. Uh, this VT row R versus channel lanes, partially depleted and bulk are basically the same. Fully depleted tends to roll off um, uh, worse. All right? And uh, why is that? I used the XD Max to remind you. There's another picture to remind to 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 to, to say it. And I started drawing this picture to you. Um, actually, it's, it's the same thing, but I'll try to um, to 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 give. Okay. One way to say it is this. You know. What really is happening is that without a ground plane in the back, then the coupling between the channel and say the bottom of the drain of the of the uh, of the junction becomes significant. If we did have a ground plane, what happens is that this ground plane actually prevents the or shields this potential from the impact of this. The potential at this point, for example, if you can visualize it, right? Because this is really a shielding thing. I don't know if you can you can see that. All right, let's put it this way. I'll, let me exaggerate this drawing a little bit. Let's say there's a ground plane point here, right? All right, there's a ground plane here. All right, okay. Now, will does it will this point see any effect when the potential say at this point change between zero and VDD? Do you expect to see anything? Assuming this ground plane is fixed at zero, do you expect anything? No, right? If you have a you know sort of a intuition about electrostatics, what happens? You're really determined by these, right? This this ground. On that hand, if you take this away, there's no ground. Now the electric field line from here can go anywhere. Some of it will, will end here. Whereas with the ground plane, all the field lines here would just end on the ground plane. Would have no chance of coming to this point. Can you visualize that? All right. So that's one way to understand why small XD max is, is good. I know that uh, it's not so easy to visualize why small XD max is good. Right? I try to say it's the same as the, as the uh, gate oxide. It's true. And, uh, but one way it does the same thing is that it tends to hold this to its potential, just avoid other potentials to impact this. Okay? All right. All right, so that's one thing uh, unusual about uh, SOI is the floating body effect. There's a second unusual thing about SOI is called self-heating. Now, because there's a SiO2 layer separating our active silicon film and uh, the bottom silicon, which may be visualized as a heat sink, Usually, this bottom silicon that is either soldered or something put on a, another package, which can take the heat away, right? So now we put the uh, silicon dioxide film, which is not a good thermal uh, conductor in between, between where the heat is generated, it's in the top silicon film, and where heat is taken away, usually through the, through the bulk. And uh, as a result, the silicon film could get warmer than in the bulk, right? And uh, in extreme cases, well, if you look at IV curve, let's say, right? If you measure it very often, you see this. So, you know, as you increase VD, first the current increases is expected. Then instead of saturating, 
you start to decrease. All right? Or maybe this is exaggerating too much. Maybe I'll do it this way. It's more like this. You know, maybe I should saturate a little bit, but near, near high VD, you start to drop, for example. Right? And this is understandable because power dissipated is equal to VD times ID. Right? So near the high VD region, then you start to see self-heating. Also, you need large VG because when VG is small, ID is, ID is small. You don't see that. It's when VD is large and ID is large, you can see that. All right? This is usually often is quite obvious. Can be obvious, let's put it this way, if you want to look for it. So as a result of this, there's this concept that, gee, self-heating is really a problem. It's really serious. It's going to, to, uh, to be a, a big disadvantage for a high-speed processor or, or something like that. Actually, the situation is not that, that bad. Let me give you an example you will see. Um, you probably don't know the, know the answer to this, so I'll give it to you. SiO2 is a poor um, uh, uh, thermal uh, conductor than, uh, than the oxide. And the difference of the thermal conductivity is 10, 10 times worse. It's OK? All right? All right? Now, if I have a 0.4 micron of uh, thick of SiO2, right? 0.4 micron thick of SiO2. What's the equivalent silicon film thickness that gives the same thermal impedance? 4 micron. And what's the silicon substrate thickness to begin with? <laughs> Probably 400. You may let that down to 200. So when you think that way, gee, why should uh, there be uh, that much uh, effect? Why is that really uh, uh, a problem? Uh, you, you, you have a comment? Yeah, I mean, that, that assumes that there's a plane that's been evenly heated, but the heating is actually point source heating. Very so good. Very that's good. a big difference. Right? Very good. So one concept is that the uh, heating is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is isolated, uh, is uh, concentrated. As a result, there is more impedance through this uh, spreading resistance problem, and therefore you, you will get a more, more temperature rise, right? Okay, I agree with you. But let's do things one, one, one step at a time. All right. So as a result, with this kind of um, a power dissipation in this device, you will see this particular temperature rise. All right. Next, I want you to estimate for me, what is the uh, power dissipation in the, at this point? What is power dissipation? A typical transistor, knowing you know what kind of scale are we talking about in this ID scale? Are we talking about nanoamp, or are we talking about what? Well, I told you this is usually the high VG, right? So it's VG equal to VDD. So it doesn't matter. You're, I haven't told you W yet. All right, I'll force you to give me an answer. Let's say W is equal to, uh, to uh, 10 micron, all right? It's a common large transistor in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in a circuit. It's a 10 micron uh, wide transistor. What do you expect this current to be? Many milliamp because it should be, you know, half a microamp, uh, milliamp at least per micron, right? Maybe 0.7 microamp per micron. So let's call this five milliamp. All right, milliamp is good enough answer. I'm, I, I like that, right? Five milliamp, five volt. Okay. I'm sorry, five milliamp. Now, how many volts are we talking about? 3.3 is excellent. Let's call that 2.5 uh, 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 volt right now. Okay. So how many milliwatt is dissipated at, in this d device? Can you tell me? What is it? 12. Let's just call it 10 milliwatt for, for, for simplicity, all right? All right? Now, in a real circuit, in a, in a, in a, in a um, um, Pentium chip, how many milliwatt do you think is dissipated in a transistor? Let's work backward. I tell you that there are, uh, just for round the number, there are 100 million transistors in a chip, let's say, all right? And many chips have more than that. Let's just say 100 million transistors. If indeed each transistor is dissipating 10 milliwatt, can you tell me how many watt will this chip dissipate? 10 milliwatt times 100 million, 10 to the eighth transistors. How much? One megawatt. Thank you for so quickly giving me the answer. So is that possible? So on the average, and by the way, average is good because each transistor about dissipates about the same number of, uh, of watt, by the way, all right? It's not that it's a big uh, discrepancy. So 
each transistor probably therefore is really dissipating a um, you know micro watt or less thousand times less than this so if this is the result of heating to say 300 degree one thousands of that would be what 0.3 degrees so it's going to be important is it going to not be important all right so in real operation I think it's fair to say it's not important it's really important in terms of modeling because how do you generate a model? You generate a model by looking at what you measure on the curve tracer of 4145. That's DC. Under DC conditions, you have significant self-heating. So the, the challenge is to start with that data and come up with uh, what really is going to be happening in a circuit. All right? So that's a modeling uh, challenge, perhaps. But don't think that SOI is going to have a t really serious self-heating problem, OK? Of course, you can always you know, invent one particular s special case where there is a problem that if you were the designer, of course, you should uh, be careful about it. Or hopefully, the, the model that used to design the circuit automatically catches that and actually handle that case as well as the case where self-heating is not important. So that will be uh, uh, the best, of course. Okay. All right. Any question about self-heating? All right. So put all this together. Let's see. What's the advantage of SOI? Near term is the performance, right? Speed, and uh, or if you say, "Gee, I um, I'm willing to uh, give up that speed," then you can use lower VDD, therefore save power. You know, for communication chips, maybe this is what you're really looking after power. You, you, you trade off the speed with, I mean, trade off, the, you, know, you don't necessarily operate a higher speed than your competitor, but you operate at lower power, right? But for processors, you want to operate a higher speed than your competitor, right? So this is where it is. And uh, so by special, I mean some, uh, some uh, a few applications, perhaps. Maybe it uh, would not uh, take a large market because there's still a cost uh, issue there. For longer term, you know, the hope is that even the cost will be lower than the bulk. You know, that's a dream right now, but um, who knows? And uh, the, uh, the, the SOI may even become mainstream, big question mark, right? Okay. All right. Any questions by SOI? We're finished about SOI. Yes. Um, you said that the output conductance uh, um, this, the ID in the saturation region, the current sort of increases with BD, mm -hmm. but uh, this thermal effect has an opposite effect. So mm -hmm. do they sort of cancel out each other? Well, it depends on which is bigger, right, and then which wins out. But you cannot count on that as, same, as being a good thing. Uh, you should think that you have two complicated things happening together. It just becomes uh, more complicated. Right. You know what I mean? Yes, they do move in different trends, and that, that's a fact. But you cannot say that. For example, they have different dynamic behavior, for example, right? You know what I mean? Right? One, in terms of DC versus uh, the, the self-heating, I said, under DC, it's 1,000 times stronger than in the ring oscillator operation. But that floating body effect is not that much difference. It happens in, float, in, in ring oscillator operation as well. You know what I mean? So in that sense, the fact that they're moving in different trends does not mean they cancel. So the word cancel is too strong, right? OK? All right. Well, two questions. One is, um, why are defects not more of an issue with SOI than with, you know, if you have some defects, sure. normally we drive them. That's number one. And then the second one would be, what fraction really in a modern, modern, modern process is starting wafer cost of total cost? Meaning, what kind of a cost adder really practically are people seeing for going to SOI in terms of finished wafers compared right. to? You know, right now, you probably uh, will pay, uh, say, 100, let's say, let's suppose you pay uh, uh, 50, $50 for bulk wafer, you probably will pay um, $200 for SOI wafer. That's a lot. Is that a lot? Exactly. Then when you look at a fit to finish wafer, it's not that much, right? But then if you don't have to pay that extra 150, that's big, big deal. So uh, depends on the application. Okay. All right. Okay. Other comments. All right. Defect part. Defect part. All right. Yes. Defect part. Well, you know. 
this is the kind of thing that you only can um, um, uh, can uh, rationalize after it's done. I mean, before before this uh, 15 years ago, I don't think anyone can really predict it will ever be as good as uh, it is today. Right? Of course, uh, now that it's very good. Well, if you understand the material science, I suppose, if there's just no, if you truly just annul out all this defect while it's being created, why cannot it be as good as fresh? No, I cannot be right. <laughs> you know, if you don't annul them out, you you wait until there's a lot of damage, then start annealing out. Actually, there will be some uh, competing process for this defect maybe to form larger secondary defect that you cannot annul out, and that maybe is a problem. And this technology turns out, in some sense, it's a better technology than annealing of a source string junction because it anneals as the damage is created. When you have very small enough amount of point damage it's probably easy to visualize that can be annealed out totally, right? Unlike you already amorphize it, and then you try to recrystallize it. Does that make sense, the three rem and the uh, um, your material scientist? Does that make sense that it's it, um, thinkable that actually you could get very high quality material? How does that strike you? How surprising is this to you? I, I, I had a hard time on this. I probably We'll work on this on my term project. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Yeah, all right. All right. Good. Uh -huh. Good. All right. So we have a few minutes left. Let me just mention another thing that's uh, related to um, SOI. In a sense, it's a material that made in a thin film of silicon on an insulator. But in this case, it's not single crystalline, sil uh, not single crystalline silicon, but uh, a polycrystalline silicon or even amorphous silicon. This type of transistor is called thin film transistor, or TFT. The largest application of thin film transistor today is in display. Right? Okay. And uh, we would like to really fabricate circuits on glass together with the um, other things that's on glass. Okay, so-called active matrix display, the highest performance display today, do have transistors at each pixel. Okay, so how does that transistor made? So we would just put a layer of either polycrystalline or amorphous silicon there. Okay, try to give a, make a high quality, make a large green, for example. We actually put down a dielectric, where often it's nitride rather than oxide. And uh, there can be a gate material, and sometimes the gate is put down first. In this case, the metal is put down the uh, uh, gate and pattern on the glass first put down on glass and pattern, this is metal gate, and then uh, nitride is deposited as insulator, and then amorphous silicon film is deposited over. That's also fine. There are many different ways of doing this. This is called the TFT. All right? There's a second uh, uh, kind of TFT that was in use in production for a while, and um, in the you know, 0.5, maybe 0.35 micron generation of SRAM. As you know, SRAM is made of six transistors. And this is a really uh, problem, because it takes a large area. And uh, so many things have been done to try to, uh, to replace this top two transistors with something less than a good uh, um, uh, transistor. Because these two top transistors really serve as something called a load. So um, one technology is to use polycrystalline resistor. Okay, this is called a polyresistor DRAM, uh, SRAM. In that case, you only have four transistors. And this uh, polysilicon resistor can be laid out on top of, uh, of the active transistor, so saves, saves a significant area. And some company continue to make them into 0.25 micron technology, and perhaps even 0.18 micron technology. So then this TFT coming this way, he says, OK, I would not just replace this with a, uh, with a resistor. I actually would replace it with a thin film transistor. You know, it cannot be worse than a uh, polycrystalline res resistor. It may not be as good as a P-channel bulk transistor, but somewhere in between. So the way to do this is to deposit polycrystalline silicon okay, as the active material. And it's going to have SiO2 as the gate material, have polycrystalline silicon as the gate. And you end up with a polycrystalline TFT as the load transistor. All right. And uh, unfortunately, for SRAM, 
the uh, uniformity of device so important, low leakage is so important, it was found that when you get to, you know, say 0.18 micron generation, because of scaling of the transistors, these top transistors are not that big anymore, and uh, this uh, TFT SRAM does not look as competitive, so this technology is moving away, but, but um, um, certainly um, you can still find them today. Okay, questions about TFT? All right, if not, let me see. Uh, all right, let me just finish this, uh, uh, just a, a few words, this last slide, and I'll let you go. Just some concluding remark on uh, SOI. Today's SOI material is m quite mature, largely delivering a desirable level of performance. It has significantly improved over the last couple of years. All right? And uh, as, uh, one problem actually turns out to be supply of the silicon wafer now. Now, if uh, indeed uh, overnight a uh, lot of uh, companies come to SOI, the supply is going to be a problem. But, uh, but hopefully, um, that, that the the, uh, the, the um, supply industry is going to is going to be there when when really a volume use is is there. SOI wafers insertion into bulk silicon fabrication should be straightforward with minor equipment adjustment needed. Okay, many companies have concluded that's the case. So if indeed there's advantage, then we don't have to really make big change in the, uh, in the, in the, in the factory, such that you know, maybe someday uh, even foundries like TSMC, UMC will offer SOI. That certainly will be a big uh, boom for this technology. Bulk silicon process adaptation uh, to SOI technology does not pose major limitations, particularly for partially depleted device. That is, if you wanted to, to transfer a bulk silicon technology that's already developed, because mo many companies, when they make the decision of moving to SOI or, or not, already have a working bulk technology. So if I just poured that into SOI material, looks like it's not going to be very difficult if you use partially depleted device, right? Because you know, things really very, very similar. Circuit design requires careful analysis for the impact of floating body effect on individual blocks. Process and our device design may need to be ad adopted to control uh, floating body effect in, in, in some. Okay? So that's some, uh, uh, some result. Any, any um, uh, questions or comments about SOI? Okay, I'll see you next week. <laughs>